Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and um, thank you all for being here, and I'm really delighted to be here. This is one of these kind of beginning days that we look back on in 10 years, and we'll wonder, and we'd be delighted that we were here, and we wonder what's happened, because, because kind of what I'm trying to say is that this social farming is not just a nice addition to what is um, already an adequate care system for people with, with special needs or people with mental health difficulties. It, it's, actually, um, it's actually not at the cutting edge, it's slightly ahead. It's where we need to be heading towards. The rest of us need to catch up. And what you'll see is that actually it's kind of going back to some truths that we knew and to the way we did business with people in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, so it's, it's reclaiming a, a kind of wisdom that's in our DNA, but we've forgotten it. And I think that's what's really interesting. I spent last Thursday uh, with Vincent Coyle and some of these loud, raucous gentlemen here in front. Um, and uh, it was my real chance to see what this is about. So I want to talk a bit about what this is about. Well, I think the first thing is that it's about taking time. Here we lifted out the kitchen table, out into a beautiful garden, and we drank tea and coffee, lots of it. And we ate fresh homemade scones with jam, brown bread with freshly mashed up eggs. And we talked a lot about nothing in particular. But important news was shared. I met my dad last weekend. And astute observations were made. Trailing lines of white smoke a jet leaves behind in the sky. I'd say it's an Aer Lingus flight en route to Lourdes, <laughs> said Esmond. Now, how Esmond knows this amazes me, but he seems very sure. Aeroplanes are his passion. He can distinguish airlines by the sound of different crafts and the destination he works out by the direction of their path in the sky. I love his passion and I envy his confidence. And we, as we sit there and chat, um, a butter churn is passed between us, and we each play our part in turning the handle, which has a beautiful, silky, smooth mechanism. And we watch as the cream inside that large glass is agitated, and yellow droplets of fat slowly clump together to form butter grains. Vincent, our host, Mary, the professional who came with people, and Brian and Tommy and Kean and Esmond and Paul, who visited. Um, that was our little troupe, and we spent the day doing very little. Um, it was an amazingly full day. Isn't it true? And we did really important things. They made the scones, they made the bread, we ate the food, we took time. And then we began to to kind of explore the farm. And of course there are jobs to be done and plenty to do. But the beauty for me of the whole day is that we were, it wasn't overcrowded with a list of activities that had to be ticked. And it's really important that we see social farming as a way back to helping people to rediscover the simple joy of just being. And particularly being with nature. Because that's a, a disconnect for all of us. Wordsworth said, the world is too much with us. You remember this from your leaving cert? Just this time of the year, you were learning it off by heart. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending. We lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We've given our hearts away, a sorry boon. And I think social farming is about getting back our hearts. It's getting back that connection. And for me, that connection and that heart is at the core of mental health. Which is, which is a sense of being okay with myself in my own skin and feeling I have a place in the world and that I have something to do that I can manage, okay? But we spend so much time trying to give people all those kind of key skills to be mentally healthy and be, to be, active, be, be productive young people or productive old people that we actually miss all of that sense. And, and I think the beauty of the day was just, you know, uh, being together and there is a great gift in people who, have, uh, who are called participants, you know. They have a kind of special sensitivity. 
Um, and that sometimes can be hard in a family because they remember everything and they sense the atmosphere. They're the glue that holds the family together. They're the black box that doesn't forget anything. And they react to atmospheres. And they're the ones that are most likely to say that the emperor has no clothes, so they'll call it. And that's not easy. And that's why sometimes they relate to strangers or outsiders much more easily than family members. But isn't that true of all of us? You know, the people we find most difficult to get along with are the ones to whom we're related. That's just a fact of life. So, and farmers, I mean, you know, if you think this is the high road to heaven, you've got to learn something here because you'll find that this isn't so much about you doing something wonderful for other people, which, by the way, you are, because it takes time and it takes patience to build up trust and rapport. But this is much more about, or equally as much, about what you get from that experience. And it's your openness to what you can get is almost more important than what you have to give. That you're kind of humble enough and respectful enough that you can, and you can say, I can get something. There's something beautiful being offered here. Just the simplicity of being together and churning the butter churn. That's that's something in it for me. That's pure gold, and it nourishes the soul. So at the heart of social farming is reciprocity. It's all about give and take and give and take, or really give and receive. That's a better way to put it, I think. Um, and I think for farmers, there's the added thing that their lives can be very isolated. And for none of us, it's not a good thing to be too isolated and to be alone with all the stuff in our heads churning around the whole time. So it's good to have company, and we all need ways to be taken out of ourselves. So, what do we do? How do we spend the day? Well, there was a gentleness about it, you know? It was something about just, we moved from one thing to the next very slowly, and Yet, I'd have to say, we were very present to what we were doing. It wasn't like we, we skimmed over things. We didn't speed date the animals on the farm. We actually spent time with them, you know. Um, and so this was very important. Important things like brushing down the donkey. Exactly. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Um, um, and, and Vincent showing people, and this is very important, the farmer becomes the kind of midwife that allows this connection to happen between a participant and nature and, and a wild animal. And, and, yeah, he recognizes that donkey, there's no doubt. Um, or the cow, Zimbabwe. Is that Zimbabwe? Yeah. And, uh, and again, just to touch a wild animal, to feel their energy, and, and to feel that, the, imagine that the animal might actually notice that somebody is paying attention and connecting in a very close way with them. And that in turn, they give something back. They give back trust. They give back an energy. They give back a warmth. And, and something is happening. The other thing that's happening is that, that when, when that person is, is approaching the animal, um, when they're brushing down the donkey, that, you know, in a sense, in that moment, they're being themselves and they're 100% okay. There's nothing needing to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with them. They are who they are and that donkey ain't judging them. That donkey is saying, you're perfect. And, and I love you being here. And, and in a sense, that sense, the, the whole t in, in, if you can imagine a service system that we've created that constantly reminds people that they're not quite at the races, they're not quite good enough, that they have to be fixed, that they have to learn some skills before they'll be good enough. I don't think we mean to say those things explicitly, but we do, we do, because we're all the time trying to fix them. But to actually have the experience that I'm complete and I'm enough, and I have something to give, and I can relate, and I'm not being judged, I think is very, very healing. Um, I'm not lacking. I have something to give. I have something to give. I have something to give. You know, like, it's the one thing that people don't get uh, so much in services is a sense of what they have to give. I, I often look back on James's and think, 
that the times that mattered most were often when the so-called patients experienced that they had something to say or to give to another patient. And it was that moment of just feeling that they had something to give that was nearly more important than an awful lot of what they were getting. From the point of view of professionals, we always imagine it's what we're giving them is what's making them better. But we kind of miss the point. Um, I think the other thing is, is chickens. You know, I mean, uh, you have 90,000 of them. That's a lot of eggs. Um, yeah. You recognize this one. But I think what is beautiful is to hold that chicken. And I think Esmond has a particular gift for holding this particular chicken because every week he goes, he does this. And that chicken, although I may not have captured it, is completely at ease in his arms, you know? And what a gift that is, to hold something. Can you imagine? And, you know, in the psychiatric... Yeah. In the psychiatric ward of most of our uh, hospitals, uh, you know, there's very few chickens and there's very few um, opportunities <laughs> to hold things, you know. Uh, in fact, holding is forbidden, you know. Um, and I think it's very important, again, to say that this happens because somebody mediates that connection and that somebody is Vincent and he'll be talking to you later, and I hope I haven't stolen his thunder too much. Um, uh, but he has an amazing story, and the thing that, you know, strikes me is that I've known Vincent for a long time, and this dream has been a long time coming. But he held on to it all the time. It's 19 years, is it? Uh, 23 years? Yeah, and, and like that's, I think that's a real lesson to all of us, that sometimes the best the best visions we have, the best dreams, are, are, are laid down early in our lives, you know? Um, and, and we just have to trust them because sometimes it wasn't the right time. But we come back to them again and again. You know, Paul Simon's great line, he was 17. Hello, darkness, my old friend. But a vision softly... Shh. Yeah. And this is a poem. This is a nice one. A vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And that vision that is planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. It's still there. And you know what? He produced that song at 17. They, they got a record deal from Columbia. The whole thing crashed. It collapsed. They went on tour. It failed. It never made anything. They broke up. Uh, they lost touch with it with Columbia. Columbia canceled them. They were no... They were not a success. And then in 1965, at the end of 65, the producer of the Birds liked it and put in some guitars and drums and went to number one. It was the 18th most played song in the 20th century in, 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 on, on the radio or anywhere else. And when Paul Simon sang that song in Connecticut recently at the memorial service for those children, and that's what he sung. And my God, it was still alive, you know? But it, it can take time. Just, I think that's really important. It takes time. So I think that's the other thing, the pace. That nature and farms are all about a pace that's intimately connected to the cycle of the year. And, and every farmer knows that it takes time, and more time than we imagine any of us need to do anything. And... and and if you don't pay attention to what's happening, you can miss the flowering hawthorn bush. It can be here and gone before you know it. So taking time to slow down and work with the cycles uh, is really important. And, and it also teaches us about our own cycles because we're not that different. And we have in our thinking about people and mental health and growth, I think we have very unrealistic and very unhelpful notions of the kind of pace of things. Am I boring you? God, I hope not. Right. Um, um, so, I think that uh, mental health, you know, it's, uh, it's so all this touching and, and this, this, this befriending and this welcoming and this sense of stepping out of your own skin and being part of something bigger. I mean, that's, where do you get it? You know, it's beautiful. And it's not, it's not, it's not a, a small thing. It may be the big, big thing, and all the other things are like small things, you know? And yet we think of all the other things as the big thing. I am, I, um, yeah, presence, relationship. 
We all know the thing that matters most in our life, particularly around feeling okay with ourselves, is company. This is all about company. But it's not just the company of each other, it's the company of nature and animals, and it's, it's, it's opening all that out. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, it, this strikes me a little bit when I think about mental health. I just want to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, you all know your farms were kind of... Um, well, they were just invaded in, in, in 1946 to 1953 with the Rural Electrification Act, and they, you know, electricity was laid down, and there was a great fear about that because it, it, it was going to potentially destroy the houses of farmers, and at night until 1959, almost every uh, uh, rural household would plug out every appliance going to bed at night in case they all burned down, you know? There was a real fear, um, and, and I think change brings fear, and I, I think that Yet, when you think what it gave us, it gave us an electric light. It gave us a light that we have here. We gave us a light in our every kitchen, something we take totally for granted, and that is a very, you know, hopefully addition to our life. When I think of mental health, I think this is the kind of image we get, a very frightening image of old hospitals that maybe, you know, meant well, but they, 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 they weren't the best place for people um, yeah. Do they look familiar? Hope not, but maybe they do. Oh, it's your house, is it? <laughs> um, but, it's, uh, but I think where we're trying to get to is, is, and I think we've had a, we've really not done mental health. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> anyway, we've not done mental health very well, and I think we're having to learn. And I think what I hope we're doing through beginning to address stigma and address our shame and fear is that just like the light in the kitchen, we're trying to make mental health a kitchen conversation, not a cow. Uh, cows come and um, try to make it a kitchen conversation. Something that we can just, is, 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 that, that it's actually in that conversation that we find ourselves and each other and mental health, and it's not in an institution. The other thing is that, you know, when you think of the term uh, the institution, what's a common term we use? We call it funny farm. Where did that come from? Well, Funny Farm came from the Quakers who in the 17th, 18th centuries began to develop farms and open their farms to people who had mental health difficulties. And just let me read you what they were doing and see, does this sound familiar? Um, excuse me now while I find my text. Um, right. So... The farms were places where there were walks and, and where people could do some light work, where people were welcomed into a large family-like unit built on kindness and trust, where people were free to wander around the retreats. They were called retreats, and that's what the Quakers called them, um, around the gardens and fields which were stocked with domestic animals and where there was a minimum use of any kind of constraint. You know, doesn't that sound familiar? in terms of today. And then in 1847, we all evolved and we appointed medics in charge of all of these retreats and we changed therapy into, was replaced by medication and uh, institutional ethos was, was taken on board and the community tight family knit feeling thing was thrown out. We, we progressed. Um, and that's the point. We need to deprogress a little bit. And now we're opening out our institutions. We had 21,000 people in institutions on any given night in 1960, in the 60s in Ireland, and now it's down to less than 1,000. So we're making some progress. But still, the question is, what happens when doors are opened, when walls are taken away? Do people walk out into other institutions, little ghettoed hostels on North Circular Road in Dublin? 3,000 people were living on those at one point um, from Brendan's. You know, where, where do people go? And, and where do people find a sense of belonging? Because that is what's healing, and that's what's, what they're looking for. And the truth is, most of them go, certainly those with mental health difficulties, back to living alone with widowed parents who look after them often with very little support, and that's what counts for community mental health. Of course, there are day centres they can go to, but, but you know what? We have a long way to go to bring people back in. Um, I want to just give you a sense of bringing people back in. For me, I, I did this very briefly, worked in, in northern Ghana, 
and uh, with a mental health movement called Basic Rights, Basic Needs. And in, you know, when they started in 2005, there were 8,000 people like this guy. I photographed this guy, and he just, um, and, he, and that was in 2007. Um, but he was in shackles and chains and, and often living out in an outhouse because he had mental health difficulties, and they were frightened, and they didn't know. It's not that they, didn't, that they, they were being cruel to him. They didn't know how to to deal with him. They didn't know how to uh, cope with his voices. They didn't, they were afraid he would run away or, you know, so they, they had no other way. And the great thing about this group is they didn't go in there like, you know, George Bush and free all these people. They, they began to work with the communities to understand what was happening. And they would do it by bringing together the families and local people who cared. And they'd sit around in the, under trees and under uh, covers in, 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 little, in, in jungle villages. And they'd get, each person would be helped to talk about life from their point of view. So the family member would stand up and say what it's like having someone locked up in the back. And the guy in the back would stand up and say what it's like being locked up in the back. And often it was the first time any of them heard him speak. And then the, the, the local uh, services were talking, the, the nurses or the veterinary nurses or whoever was there would talk about uh, uh, what it was like trying to do what they could do with so little, you know. So, and, and then they began to develop a community approach. They had a psychiatrist two days a week in Tamale, which served 14 million people in northern uh, Ghana. So that was the end. That was, the, that was it. So they didn't have the option of psychiatry. They had two medications, Tegretol and Largactyl, uh, anti-anxiety, mood stab and a mood stabilizer, and that treated everything. Um, and uh, so, you know, and, and they began to make do. They started to, uh, organic, mainly organic farmers began to kind of open their farms to helping people to, to work and teaching skills, and people who repaired shoes helped people to learn that trade. And, and then micro-lending got involved and gave them, like, five euro they had to pay back under pain of death in nine months. And if they did, they'd get 10 euro or 20 euro, and they'd be built up a little business. And the community met, and whenever they met, they, well, every meeting we had, it ended in dance. You know, it was extraordinary. And you could not tell the mentally unwell from the ordinary people, from the service. You, you know, it was just fantastic. So here's some, you know, young people I work with now, and I guess we're trying... Through creating, through, it inspired for me the, the jigsaw model, which brings young people and service users and families together and says, look, let's, how can we do better for our young people? It, we're just not doing very well, particularly if they're 15, 16. And all of you know you're as happy as your least happy child. And if you have a 15, 16-year-old who's not doing well, you will tear your hair out. And you are tearing your hair out. You know what to do with them. And that is very difficult. And if they're doing well, by the way, you feel suddenly your life is worth living and it has been worth everything. So we've set up places called Jigsaw where people, and in each county there's a different, as Jigsaw Donegal, and where people can go and people can walk in for free off the street. Um, and, and, and when they walk in, they walk in into an invisible matrix of services. They can get anything from the sports coach to the peer counselling, to uh, a family and drug and alcohol counsellor, or to the psychiatric team. Very few need the, the local psychiatric team, a very tiny, tiny number. So out of the thousands, we've seen uh, a small number. But we make sure they get there quickly. And this was the launch of, of Jigsaw uh, in Donegal recently, and this is Jigsaw in Meath and in Navan, just on the main street. And this is Jigsaw in Galway. That building looks fantastic, but it's just occupying the bottom. But we got it for half the rent we were paying in an old, smaller building. And these are the young people that advise us, because I think, I think for me, what I've learned most of all is that we've actually got to build our services and build our thinking around the people we're trying to serve. And we've got to work with them so that we're sure that what we're doing works for them. And when we lose sight of that, we actually lose our way because we become so conceptual and we become so into our own particular silo. And, and I think for me, so in Headstrong, there are young people on the board. Every staff member is being recruited with some young person on the, on the interview panel. And they're part of our policy, part of our evaluation, part of our business plan development. Um, and they have grown from 10 that I began with in 2007 to hundreds around the country. And they're, you know, I expect a lot of them. I don't feel sorry for them. I don't have any pity for them. I respect them much too much for that. And they are fantastic. They're actually the energy they bring. 
But it's like, that's the energy we need, you know. Um, and I, I just love, anyway, the social farming. I'm going to leave you with one little quote, which is a very Irish one, is that, you know, we're people who live on the edge. You know, we're on the edge of financial ruin at the moment. We're on the edge of the uh, Europe, which is chaotic. We're on the edge of the Atlantic, you know. Um, and I think we have survived for a long, long time on the edge. And this woman is a great uh, social farmer. You didn't know that about her. But she had everybody come and help her make bread and sit outside, and she told stories, and she wrote down the stories. And the stories she told were the stories of their life. There were stories full of lust and murder and betrayal and jealousy. They were gutsy. Forget carnation. This stuff was real hardcore. This, this woman, but she wrote stories and told that fitted the lives. And when we have a story that fits our life, we can live with our life. And mental illness is a story that's never been told. That's what it is. And, and every person has to find their way into a story that's big enough for the life they have. And sitting around that table talking about, I met my dad, or, you know, as somebody said, I said, how do you like coming here? He said, I'm really excited. Was that Esmond? Was that you? Or Kian, I think, said that. I'm really excited coming. And I said to him, why? And I said, because I settle here. You know, I mean, wow, that's incredible, you know, and that's not a small thing. But, you know, what Peg, who said, when they asked her, what was the secret of your resilience? Well, what kept you going? Because this woman had a patent on misery. I mean, she had more death in her family than you've had dinners. She had more death and loss than you've had chickens. Um, <laughs> she just had so many things. So how did she keep going till 85, smoking a pipe? You know, wouldn't to live, you know. Um, but anyway, um, and she said, she said it was her Shkag Hela Avaris Nadini. And for our visitors, I'll translate, and that means that we lived in the shelter of one another, you know. We, the people survived by living in the shelter of one another. And that's what did it. And by telling our story, by that kitchen conversation, by that cup of tea, it's not... The, it's, it's, it's that simple, and it was here a long time ago, and we're going back to it, and we're reclaiming it. And, and this is the way ahead, guys. And I tell you, in 10 years' time, it'll just be so much, you know, taken for granted. And people wonder, why don't we always do this? Or in 20 years' time, it'll just be, you know, the way we do business, okay? And, and it's great to be here today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.